Hello, hello. Hello, everybody. I look live. Am I live? Hey, he's alive. Mike Myers. Yeah, I've been watching uh, Robin Williams. What was that, Vietnam? Good morning, Vietnam. So today I sound like a disc jockey on just about everything. Hi, it's Mike Myers. And he's not quite ready to start doing his Ask Me Anything for today. But it looks like he's up. Everybody's here, happy days. Hi everybody, this is Mike Myers doing his Ask Me Anything live stream series here through YouTube. The goal of this Ask Me Anything live stream is to provide those of us who are somewhat isolated by coronavirus an opportunity to discuss CompTIA certification, in particular, IT Fundamentals A+, Net+, and Security+. We can go outside of that, but those are, that's really, that's my lane that I like to stay in. So first of all, who's telling me my sound is good? TS and Henry and Dave Rush, thank you guys so much. I'm still and always will be paranoid about that from here on in that we're gonna have trouble. <coughs> And let me tell Scott Jernigan, the team's on. There we go, all right. So first of all, I got kind of a little bit of an extra surprise for you. We do have a few questions today. Um, but first of all, just because you guys are kind enough to show up, we are offering a 50% discount on, I believe, oh Scott, don't tell me I'm doing this wrong, on every single one of our test banks that we're currently selling here at Total Seminar. So that is a 50% discount. So all you have to do is head over to totalsem.com and type in this code. Uh, I'm gonna let Scott type it in on the uh, live chat so you guys will know what the code is. Oh, Andre, no, I'm coughing. Uh, I'm coughing because I just took a big swig of really nasty coffee and I'm trying to deal with it. Well, anyway, guys, I have a surprise for you today. Something a little bit fun, something a little bit different. So I get every day I'm getting questions about all these amazing NASA t-shirts that I keep getting. So I thought you guys would like to meet the person who actually gets me those t-shirts. So I'm gonna introduce you to my friend, Melissa Bestick, better known as Wissa. Hey, Wissa, come on in. Yes, I've warned her about this, so we're not coming in completely cold here. Here, scooch on over, say hello. Hello. Hi, guys, so this is Melissa Bestick. So first of all, what do you do for NASA? I am an operations planner for the International Space Station, which means I plan the space station crew's work day. So, I mean, they, like, how closely do you track what astronauts and cosmonauts do? Uh, my Russian counterparts work with cosmonauts. Okay. I mainly work with astronauts cool. and into five minute intervals. Wow, so what if they have to go to the bathroom? Well, if we have an experiment, we'll time it, but they guess get <laughs> okay. <take> time out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think you were going to go that way. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that can be interesting for science, what comes out of an astronaut, huh? Um, so we just had a big launch today. That was cool. We did. HTV just launched earlier today, bringing up cargo from JAXA in Japan. Yeah, they actually uh, brought up the last batch of lithium-ion batteries to, they had old, uh, they were... Uh, NICADs. They're old NICAD batteries. You saw those big solar panels on the ISS. Those are all being serviced by NICADs until maybe started a year ago that they started? Oh, it's been several years they've been working on this. So. Oh, all right. Can we do this? Guys, can you hear me now? Okay, I tried to shift to a different microphone. Can you hear me now, guys? Are we back now? 
Guys, type in the live chat if you can hear me. Okay, good. Woo! Boy, that was terrible. Sorry about that, gang. So, uh, what was the last thing we heard? <laughs> Anyway, so what Wiss is going to do for you guys is that she'll let me know the next time that we get uh, these t-shirts are available and you'll tell me and then I can send a link to these guys and then they can get some of these cool NASA shirts too. Yep, yeah, the link is available to anybody. Cool, all right. All right, well guys, Wissa, thanks so much for clearing that up for us. I mean, people really did like those shirts. I love those shirts too and they're they're kind of rare and cool. Mm -hmm. All righty? Yep. Yeah. Thank you for stopping in for a minute. You're welcome. All righty. Have a good broadcast. Yeah, we're gonna do our best here. <laughs> ah. All right. So, did you guys hear where to get the t-shirts? So basically now what's going to be happening here is I am going to be sending you guys, whenever these NASA t-shirts come up, special runs come up, there is a public link, they'll ship all over the world, but you have to know when these links come up because it's not a link that's always there. So there you go. Uh, but uh, we will get you some shirts and uh, then you guys can be as cool as I am when I wear these very interesting offbeat NASA shirts. So I actually asked Wissa to come today because she was, uh, she is the source for that stuff. So I think that's really, really cool. All right. Uh, anyway, so uh, that is, uh, that's where we got started. Uh, sorry, uh, guys, we were basically just talking about uh, how to get the t-shirts. So um, we're, we're not in a big panic. Sorry about that. Because the other mics still seem to be making happy bouncy noises. So I don't know what the story is. I'm cursed with sound. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get into it. We do have some uh, interesting questions. Um, before, I, I just got a couple of questions. I don't have anything big. Remember, guys, the goal of this AMA is for you to ask me questions. And uh, so that's why we call it Ask Mike Anything, right? And uh, so it's very, very important that you guys come to me with questions. Uh, from time to time, I can develop a, a larger topic, but it's going to have to come from you as an actual request. Uh, what's wrong with my voice now, Omar? Okay. Anyway, so in order to a uh, ask me questions, the best way to do it is to send me an email. So here are my two email addresses, michaelm at totalsem.com and desweds at protonmail.com. Uh, that's my Steam. If you're a gamer at all, I'm Senor Pepe. That's my phone number. Difficult to get a hold of me right now during the coronavirus, but you can always try. I ask that you call me if it's kind of a priority thing. Otherwise, just send me an email. I check my emails many, many times per day. And uh, then when in doubt, if you want to get a hold of me on just about anything else, my name is Desweds. So you want to Skype me, try Desweds. I'm just always Desweds. So remember, you are the drivers of this Ask Me Anything. We're going to this Monday, Wednesday, Friday format so that we can have more time. So we're going to a two hour format starting, well, last Monday. The important thing that you need to understand is that um, I will go for two hours or until the questions run out. So that's the important thing is that uh, have questions ready for me because I'm really here to serve you guys. Uh, from time to time, we will bring up topics uh, and, and develop those. Uh, for example, I got some interesting questions over the email about printing. And uh, A plus does harp heavily on printing and some of the questions, very interesting. And uh, so we'll be doing some printing stuff today. But uh, first of all, I do see some questions are popping in. So I'm gonna head over to the scroller and take a look. <laughs> all right, so let's take a look over here. Questions, questions, questions. Dave Brush, Nike ads. You can see. Yeah, sorry about the sound quality, guys. I could try to switch back to the other mic, but I'm afraid to. It's going to blow up. Okay, so you guys, you guys heard, you guys heard most of what Wiss has said. That if the last thing was that Wiss had said that they've been working on solar panels for over a year, they're working on upgrading the batteries from NiCads to lithium ions, and uh, today's launch out of Japan was the last batch. 
before uh, it's fully all lithium ion, so pretty happy about that. Batteries are heavy, man. Those are the most expensive batteries on Earth, I guarantee it. Okay, let's see. Got Arlene Chan, Wande Agunusi. Oh, I'm so terrible at names, I'm sorry. Uh, Javier Maggiorino. Good afternoon, Mike. I am Javier from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm signing up for Udemy courses, CompTIA Plus. Congratulating you on the quality of your courses, if not the quality of my sound during this live stream. Thank you, though, Javier. I appreciate that. Uh, are there many differences in your book from the ninth edition to the last? Yes, there's a lot of differences. In fact, I would be really, really uncomfortable with you trying to study for the current A+, the 220-1001-1002, using a now six-year-old book. Uh, so yeah, please don't do that. Yeah, I know everybody's, but I got a good deal on the old book. <laughs> there's a reason. <clears throat> Mike, what a friend list you got there. I need to update mine for some NASA admins as well. Well, you gotta remember that uh, here in Houston, you can pretty much throw a rock and hit somebody who works at NASA. Uh, pretty common group of folks out there. Uh, but they're great, it's a great organization, and it's good to have, I've got a few friends who can get me into some of the tourist area, where in behind the scenes stuff. Uh, I got to walk around the old uh, Apollo control room. That was pretty cool. Uh, get to, got to sit on the space toilet. That was fun. Yeah, they really do have a space toilet. They have to practice. You have to be certified to go to the bathroom in space. I'm not kidding. Um, Oscar Alberto Arguez Gonzalez. Now, there's a good Irish name. Oh, good day, sir. Good day to you, too. Henry, good to see you again, Henry. I'm sorry if this has already been asked, but what are your tech news and topic sources? What are my tech news and topic sources? Gosh, everything. Uh, I get so many feeds in now that I almost don't remember where the actual final sources are. Um, goodness, I almost have to put a list together on that. There's just so many different ones. Uh, Cplasman2009, have you time to peruse my email about IP addressing? I have, but I chose not to do that yet uh, because I've got a few other things. But I believe you had another question I'm going to answer today. Uh, USA Health Insurance Reform, yes. Where is the best place to get a huge set of A-plus practice questions to master the material with? Any others? Yeah, well, I mean, really, uh, lots of people sell big te practice test banks, uh, including me. And I think that my practice test banks are the absolute best that are out there. Um, we have uh, hundreds and hundreds, got pushing close to a thousand practice questions in our test bank. Don't hold me that number. Uh, in, in fact, sometimes I think we have a few too many. Uh, but the, the bottom line is is that uh, you can get our, our, my practice questions are purchasable through totalsim.com and because you're kind enough to be here today, all you have to use is the code, which my buddy Scott Jernigan will type into the live uh, stream for you. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's like MMLive53, whatever that might be. Scott will type it in here in just a moment. Remember, he's got a 10 second delay on me and he types slow. Uh, and you get it fifty percent off, so that's an amazing deal. It's it's cheap, like really cheap. So there's your, there's the answer. There are lots of other people who do provide that stuff, but uh, man, I have got so much beeping and honking going around on me. This is insane. Why am I? I basically lost my phone. Okay, well I hope nothing critical comes in over the phone. Da -da 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 -da. War atrocity, finally made some time. Yeah, good, absolutely, it's a place where even, there, these batteries aren't even on Earth anymore. Lithium ion is the most expensive battery in space, easily. Thomas Robinson, 10th and 50th, oh, fantastic, thank you. Head crab gamer, oh, you're, you're, you're like with me, Gordon. How's that for a Half-Life reference? Da -da. Just want to say thanks in the healthcare at the moment. Stay safe. Stay safe, you too, brother. Do you, uh, Wartrocity, do you have any recommended books, sites to learn Linux from nothing to something? Hmm. I don't. Boy, did that say something to me right there. 
gee, Mike, you've been talking about it for almost two years. Maybe you need to get your act together and get some Linux training together. I am sure that if you were to go to some of the major video sites, uh, uh, Lynda.com or Udemy or folks like that, they probably have some good ones. There is nothing that stands out in my view. Uh, and, uh, the nice part is we got a lot of really sharp people in here, and I'll bet somebody will type something in to the live chat to give you some ideas there, Wartrosity. Arlene, Arlene Chan, hi Mike, New York City. Where in, our, where in New York City, Arlene? I used to live in Elmhurst, Queens back in the day. Is your Security Plus Udemy course up to date with the exam? Zalem, yes it is. What path would you suggest after completing the A-plus certification? Where should I go? Thanks, Mike. Julio Garcia, go get a job. If that's the first thing, get a job. Um, it drives me crazy when people always say, hey, man, well, I want to get a, you know, I'm going to go get a bunch of certifications and then go get a job. No, no, no. It's not how it works in this industry. The only thing a certification does is puts your name at the top of a resume stack, okay? So to think that you're going to get these certifications and then get a job is not how it works. You get these certifications that get you on the top of a resume stack. You get in entry level jobs. Go get a sales job at Best Buy if you want. Uh, you know, there's lots of options out there. And uh, but you, you, you work and you get certifications on the side, nights and weekends, that's how these things go. But if you're asking just what's your next certification, uh, Julio, I'd have to ask you, well, what do you wanna be when you grow up, right? <laughs> grow up. Um, Network Plus is often a good choice for most people, uh, but I'd have to be, I'd, I'd like to know what your, what your goals are. That's always a big thing. Andrew Hutz, good to see you, Andrew. Does CompTIA offer a space toilet search? Space Toilet Plus, no. But the toilet is hilarious. I got to tell you, this thing is, you, it, okay, it's not functioning. You understand? It's just you, you use it, and this is the NASA term. I'm using NASA terminology here. You learn how to dock with the space toilet. So you earn, and to help you dock, there's a camera that points up. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <sighs> Al Mulford. Hey, Al. How's it going, brother? Good to see you there. Do I have pics of my NASA tour? I've, been, I've had multiple NASA tours and lots of pics. And yes, I do have a pic of me practicing on the space toilet. Uh, Andrew, that serious question though. What are the advantages of DisplayPort versus HDMI? Advantages, they're both great. We'd have to get into some versioning to be able to talk one slightly over the other. Uh, DisplayPort uh, doesn't have any, um, uh, what am I, uh, come on, copyright, not copyright, uh, digital rights, there's no DRM with DisplayPort if that's an issue. Uh, DisplayPort doesn't do sound, it's just a, it's just a pure video. Um, I use them both interchangeably. I, I actually don't really concern myself uh, if I'm buying a video card, if it has DisplayPort versus HDMI, unless I have a monitor that doesn't support both, which most of the monitors I do support both. I don't have a great sense on, on that one off the top of my head. I know right now Michael Smyer, who works for me, is probably going, well, there's 17 reasons. I can't think of them off the top of my head quickly. Da, 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 da. Dre Taylor, hello, Mike. I am taking the Security Plus exam tomorrow. Oh, how many performance questions should I expect? I think about three, three or four tops. I've had people take Sec Plus and get one. So. The only thing I will tell you about the performance questions on Security Plus is don't be afraid to click around within the graphic. That will make sense when you get there, but a lot of times people don't click on certain graphics and they miss some really good tools. The places to click are obvious, but sometimes you get in a hurry and don't see it. The other thing I'll warn you about on Security Plus performance exams is some of them can be a little complex, which is fun. They're actually some of the, down, some of the best the best performance questions I think that CompTIA does are in Security Plus. But um, keep in mind that they can eat up a lot of time, and you just want to be careful about your time when you're going through those. Gino, hey Gino, thanks to your book and videos, passed my network plus 45 minutes ago. Hey, congrats, Gino, well done. I need to have one of those live streams where you get the little applause thing going on the side. Oh my God, that's a good idea. Um, Kept getting in the way of the question instructions. Oh, the online whiteboard was a problem. So uh, guys, just for those of you who are taking online, we've got some secondary information that is saying that you can now bring a paper and pen for online exams 
Gino, was there anything that straight up said you can't do that? Uh, we haven't found anything, but what we've heard is that you cannot bring a paper and pen. And now, just yes, uh, yesterday, we had some noise that said you can. So we're going to get some more information to get that clarified. Firkin, the total tester is awesome. It's just like the total testing environment. Yeah, Firkin, we work really hard to do the, to actually try to mimic the look and feel of the CompTIA exams. The number one killer of the people to take CompTIA certification is test anxiety. So anything I can do to reduce test anxiety, to try to make stuff, you know, to reduce the number of surprises uh, is to uh, do something like that. So thank you, we work pretty hard at it. Javier again, sorry about, uh, really dude, sorry about messing up your last name. Uh, to program in computer security, what do you think of Python? What programming language do you consider best? <laughs> I, don't, I don't consider any programming language best. See, because I'm not a programmer, okay? And I, I'm, I'm gonna do system support and analysis and some security features. So it's really important to me, more than anything else, to be able to run other people's scripts. So I don't care if it's PowerShell or Python, if I'm in a situation where I need something, I'm gonna go look for something that somebody's already done. And for the record, this is how CompTIA looks at this stuff too. CompTIA does not expect you to be a programmer. CompTIA expects you to have a basic understanding of the different types of scripting languages out there and have a very rudimentary understanding of how programming works. But CompTIA wants you to be able to go if I need to run a uh, uh, PowerShell program, what does it look like? How do I run it? You know, and, and how do I make it go? And if I need to make a couple of changes within the script, like in the script it'll say yourdomain.com, so I want to type in you know totalsend.com, that kind of stuff, and then save it and then run it. But uh, it's it's not expecting you to, to be a programmer. So if you want to be get into programming. Uh, CompTIA, in my opinion, is probably not the universe you want to be in because, I mean, we're more the systems guys. We're not afraid to hold screwdrivers. By the way, when I say guys, that is uh, gender neutral, okay? I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, where you say, hey, you guys. Uh, but uh, so the important thing to, to keep in mind in that type of situation is that uh, there are great programming courses that are a whole different universe. Uh, we're really lucky to have guys like Michael Smyre, uh, who works for me, who writes amazing code. But you know, I can kind of understand what he does. I can conceptually wrap my head around it. But you know, his substantial training—I think he's a went to Texas Tech University and got a four-year degree in computer science. And uh, so that was the route he took. So for me, programming versus the, the CompTIA world are very, very different things. Zalem, thanks, brother. Right in today's code. Uh, Shook512, are the practice questions on your Total Sim the same as the ones on your Udemy? Uh, the, the ones at Total Sim are, we have a lot more on Total Sim. Uh, the, the ones on Udemy, there, there is some overlap, absolutely, yes. But the Total Sim questions are, are, are there's a lot more. Headcrab Gamer again. In your course videos, I've been dying to ask if the elders of the internet knew that you had the internet in the background. It needs to go back on Big Bed. Headcrab Gamer, you're like the first person to actually notice that I had the internet in the background in some of those videos. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, you know, I throw all these Easter eggs in all over the place, and it always makes me feel good when people see them. You know, and if you guys look closely enough, you can find my home cell phone number. You can find most of my online gaming characters. Yeah, uh, and that's just not only in the videos; it's in the books, and uh, not really in the practice questions. I didn't put in the practice questions. Mm -hmm. Julio Garcia, yes, thanks Julio, send me an email and I'll be able to help out. Uh, did we not just ask this question, USA Health for how many, before, are you just retyping it a couple of times? It's, it's gonna be about three to five, I've seen as few as one, I don't think I've ever seen more than five. There, there is no rule. 
Geraldine Berna, are you going over printers? Yes. Uh, Geraldine, we're going to do printers today. So uh, I just thought we'd take the first half hour and get some questions. Um, Yes, Jala Sosa, we're going to do laser printers today and inkjets and a whole bunch of other stuff. Harry Bruzo, I could not use pen and paper. See, Henry, that's what we've been hearing from other people. But the source we got this from, I'm not going to name it, but it was a pretty good source. Uh, so I think that what we're looking at is we've got a little bit of issue with the... We just started doing this with the online, and uh, there can be some small inconsistencies that I'm sure they will work out in the not too distant future. USA Health Reform, if you fail a CompT exam, how long do you have to wait to take it again? You can take it the next hour if you actually sign up and find a place to do it. Uh, there, there's no limit that I'm aware of. Mike Crowder, how's the job market looking today, given our current economic session for someone looking to get certified in A plus, F plus, and starting new in the industry? Mike, go get a job, okay? Uh, if you don't have certifications, then there are lots of places. Uh, here in Houston, Texas, you can get a job at Best Buy. You can probably get a job at Amazon. Uh, Fox uh, Sports up in the Woodlands is looking for people. Uh, and these are all entry-level places. They don't pay that well. Um, you know, eight to eleven dollars an hour for start, but it's the kind of job you only have for maybe six months. And then, as you start picking up certification and you start getting some experience, you move up very, very quickly. Okay, so do not be in the attitude of, oh, I'm going to get a bunch of certifications and then go get a job. That's not how this game's played. Go get a job now and get some work and get some experience underneath your belt, and then start picking up more and more certs, and then that that curve goes whoosh really, really fast. So uh, so the job market's great. The uh, coronavirus has got a little dip uh, right now. Um, I mean, if I look locally here in Houston, which is the only place I am looking, and there's still plenty of hiring going on right now. Um, we're more worried about the price of, of oil here in Houston than we are about a coronavirus, economically at least. And uh, so there, there is still hiring going on. I do not have a feel across the United States or in the world about how, how that's going. Cla CB Classman, this is what I am finding as a difference between your class's quizzes from a competitor. You actually attempt to talk us real world examples for tests and explanations. Yeah, I mean, you kind of remember, guys, I am, I'm not a test trainer. When you take an A-plus course from Mike Myers, be it videos or books or whatever, I want you to first and foremost be a great technician. Any great technician can easily pass CompTIA A-plus and probably CompTIA Net-plus. So to me, if you're a great technician, buy some practice questions so you get the look and feel of the exams and then go from there. So yeah, that's why like in my books, I sh I'll split it up into three pieces. I'll do like... Uh, historical, conceptual, test specific, and then beyond A plus or net plus or secure plus, whatever it might be. And the reason I'm doing that is because be a great technician. I mean, I want you to have the skill set to actually be able to do this stuff. And, uh, you know, God bless CompTIA. They try really, really hard to stay real world, but sometimes they're a little off, a little weird, you know, which is fine. Nobody has a crystal ball that knows exactly how, you know, society's moving forward. The other problem is, is that CompTIA has to serve an extremely broad cross-section of IT companies. So, printer questions, you know, Hewlett Packard, you know, they, they're big the contributors to CompTIA. We love them. Uh, I work on HP printers all the time. Uh, so, but you're going to have that effect. And uh, so, thanks. Uh, I, I'd like to make you first a good tech, and oh, by the way, pass the A+. Plus. Last night I was on Dion's q and I was advised that you can use paper and pen on the... Oh, who's Dion? I don't know who Dion is, I'm sorry. Thomas Robinson, where is the next computer technology going with artificial intelligence with holographic devices? <laughs> oh, if we were uh, 
just had a few beers and it was just you and me, Thomas, I'd have a very, very funny answer to that. So, uh, don't know. Arlene Chan, is technology field now called the new, the new collar jobs? The new collar jobs. Uh, Arlene, I'm unfamiliar with that terminology. Um, you know, just go to work. Well, Javier, to say that there are more, there's more, there's probably more blue collar, light blue collar tech jobs than there are programmer slots, but you know, programming in general certainly pays better, certainly at the beginning. Um, it's a different life. Uh, you'll, you'll sit in a chair all day, uh, but when I hear Michael Smyer describe how he's building these databases and all that, you know, he's painting this beautiful world. And uh, so I think it's really a matter of passion. I'm sorry, guys, but this entire IT world is way too hard to do without loving it. I always get a little nervous when people are like, well, you know, I was a tuck truck driver and then I hear IT makes money, so I'll get an IT. No, <laughs> don't do that. You'll never succeed. Uh, it, it's too hard, it moves too fast. That if you, I mean, if you, don't, if you don't just genuinely love this stuff, you know, the, Consider other options, guys, because it, uh, it, it's a tough world. Oh, my computer turned off. Jason Dion. Oh, Jason Dion. Uh, I found out about this gentleman yesterday. He does uh, Udemy videos for A+, I guess. Okay, great. Nothing wrong with competition. I'm always welcome to uh, new competitors, and uh, I'll make a point to check them out. Psalm Pharaoh, hey Mike, I like your Mike's cool tools. Uh, oh, I lost you, hold on. Ooh, Scott's giving me some good information there. Thanks, Scott. Out of curiosity, what hardware, what software application do you use to recover partitions that were deleted or formatted? Uh, for example, if you haven't backed up your system. Well, uh, some it would, it would depend how the partition was deleted. Uh, honestly, you know, uh, my first shot would probably just use Windows Repair Disk would be my first attempt, especially if I knew I was going onto a drive that was formatted as one big C drive. If I had multiple partitions, uh, uh, probably G parted it would be one of the tools I'd be looking at for. Uh, repair. I also know that there's some fairly automated uh, partition repair tools out there these days, and I'd probably look and see what was hot. I don't have one absolute tool that I would use. Marty S, pass my A plus today. Thanks for your videos. Yeah, okay, pass your first day. You got to pass one more, buddy. So good luck to you. Internet in the background, what are those funny shaped clouds? Uh, those are my background lights and uh, because I don't have my beautiful and amazing video production people here to get the lighting just perfect, this, this way at least I know my face comes out because if I turn that light off, then we're in the dark. What is a great cybersecurity practice that can make your employer competitive? Zalem, a great cybersecurity practice that can make your employer competitive. The fact that you as an employee are looking for some practice for your employer is interesting. I'd be hanging an entrepreneurial if I had the magic answer to that. Um, a lot of online services stuff that's been popping up, little mom and pops end up being big on AWS and stuff like that. I've seen some of those things. Um, the, that would probably be one big one. Um, there are some people who are playing the home security game. That's all knocking on doors and kind of stuff, but I hear they're doing fairly well there. Uh, those would be the two that would come off quickly for me. Tolowit, Daisy Wheel. No, we're not doing any Daisy Wheel printers. Super Omar 64, Mike, what steps should I take to be exam ready? Study. <laughs> All right, well, okay, no, I'm gonna give that an honest answer. The, the thing is, is you have to choose how you like to study, okay? 
Are, do you like to watch videos? Uh, are you a book reader? Do you need instructor-led training? Do you need to go to a school? Can you do it on your own? I mean, you have to answer some of these questions for yourself. The, uh, you can keep in mind, you don't have to buy anybody's training materials. You can just go take the A+. Plus. Just jump on in there, okay? So for most people, an absolute rock bottom minimum, in my opinion, would be getting practice questions. Lots of people sell great practice questions. And um, we do too. I like my practice questions. There's videos. I like my videos quite a bit. You can watch my videos either through totalsem.com or lynda.com or udemy.com. Lots of folks use those videos. Um, books, if you're the type of person who likes to read, uh, I've written a very popular book. It's been helping people pass the CompTIA A plus for close to 25 years now. And uh, then you pick your process and the way you like to study and learn. So go ahead and uh, that's, that's a good place to start on that. Looks like Andrew and Scott Jernigan are still talking about display port and HDMI. Wow, I wish I had picked up on this conversation. Andrew Hutz is looking to buy two 2080 TIs. Yeah. You must be doing some great gaming, man. Psalms 139 colon 22. I'm going to have to look that one up. Um, I hope it's nice. How much should I expect to get paid with a CCNA and Security Plus very entry level in Phoenix, Arizona? <sighs> That's always tough to say. Uh, somebody coming in like that, CCNA and Security Plus, CCNA and Security Plus really aren't entry level certifications per se. Uh, Psalms, I'd have to know more about you, man. Uh, here, Psalms, send me an email. Uh, here, use either one of those email addresses. Just send me an email real quick and kind of give me an idea of where you're at. I mean, I could throw some numbers out that would probably guesstimate and say, you know, uh, 40 grand a year as an entry level. But, you know, most people, when we talk about entry level, we talk about A plus certifications and stuff like that. CCNA is a router cert and Security Plus is entry-level security, so uh, I'd be curious what your methodology and choice to take those certifications would be to get yourself moving forward. So, uh, Psalms, please send me an email and, and let's talk a little bit. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba. If you have taken a CompTIA test years ago and failed, must you pay for a voucher? Yes. Uh, Dre Taylor, any idea what the content of the performance questions on the Security Plus may pertain to? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, Dre, I, you got, I have to be very careful about what I say in terms of knowledge of questions. I mean, wh when you take a CompTIA exam, there's a pretty aggressive uh, NDA that you sign before you take the exams. Um, I will tell you that you're going to be looking at systems, like at networks holistically and trying to determine things that might be wrong with them versus uh, attacks that might be taking place. These are at a very simplistic level. They're not complicated questions, but the simulations tend to make you want to look around on a network and check out servers and routers and switches and see how they're acting to make sure certain things may or may not be happening. How's that for a clue? Uh, there's also uh, simulation questions that in my opinion are nothing more than multiple choice, but that's my opinion. Robert Nelson, will the CompTIA certifications along with an IT college degree make you stand out better as opposed to a degree or certification by itself? It really depends. I mean, Robert, once you've gone ahead and got a, a, a sheepskin, you know, we're talking, a, I'm assuming you mean like a four-year degree or even a double-A degree. With a double-A degree, Probably the certifications help a little bit. With a four-year degree, yeah, they help. I mean, they help. They, I mean, they give people some sense of where your knowledge is. But again, you know, the, the reality of the situation is, is that if you can begin your career with a four-year degree, do it. That's always going to be a better route. Uh, it's just not very realistic for, you know, the vast majority of people. And uh, I, I think the last time we checked, 10% of Americans have a four-year degree. 10% of the working 
people, something like that. And it's just not realistic for the other 90%. So we go, we do double A degrees through well-recognized schools that provide good job placement and great, great skills along with certifications, or you do it on your own and you work your way up. It is cool that IT is one of the few places left, in my opinion, where people with high school degrees can use OJT and certification and move themselves up. Javier, Mike, if we pass the CompTIA A+, Net+, and Security+, what would be your next step? By that time, Javier, you have to be knowing what you want to do. Are you going to become a router guy? Go Cisco. You want to do system admin? Go Microsoft. Uh, you want to become a Linux nerd? Then uh, look at uh, LPI or something like that. Uh, do you want to get into wireless networks? Look at certified wireless networking professional certifications. It's really up to you. To me, CompTIA are the core pieces that help you decide where you want to go. And then you start to move out and, and beyond from there based on your experience and what's interesting to you. Yes, I, I, I was just exposed to Jason Dion uh, yesterday. And uh, I'm going to check him out. Uh, he uh, sounds interesting. Uh, 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 don't rip your eyes, kids, right? Um, Allison Ledoux, uh, please explain and show, if possible, how to restore system settings. Allison, what system are you talking about? Do you want me to restore a Cisco router? Do you want me to restore a uh, wireless access point? Do you want me to restore a Windows system settings? And by system settings, are you talking about do our, do we need to uh, rebuild a registry? You know, uh, Allison, I need you to think about that question a little bit more and help me develop that. And I will answer it, but I'm going to need more from you. Uh, Alberto, here we go. Hang on, hang on. The scrolling goes again. I've got to keep up with this thing. Hi, Mike. Do you know if the AWS, M M MS, Azure, and OCI technologies are based on the same theoretical concepts? Yes, they are, roughly. An availability domain is the same in any technology. No, I think availability domain is AWS exclusively. I'm going to have to double check, make sure I'm not a liar on that one. Javier, what's the name of my cat? Is there a cat around here? She's over there. Uh, I call that cat Spewy. Spewy the cat. Alberto, in the Security Plus exam, ask questions about cloud services? Yes. What is your thought on a degree from ITT since it, since it no longer exists? Uh, Tony, I've hired folks for, from ITT. Uh, I, 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 first of all, I didn't know it no longer existed. Well, that might explain why we quit selling to them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I have personally hired great techs with sheepskins from ITT Technical Institute. Sam Walker, should you be working in tech support before doing CompTIA A+? I have 10 plus admin experience, but haven't got the screwdriver out, so I'm scared. Sam, we're all scared. I mean, that, you know, the thing you gotta remember, though, is that when, when you get out there, there's a certain amount of understanding that you're gonna screw up sometimes. We all do, uh, especially when you're more entry level, and, and you've got 10 plus years of admin experience, but you haven't got the screwdriver. So why, if, if you're a network admin, why would you want to, in my opinion, downgrade uh, into systems via A+. Um, I mean, if you want to start turning into a system builder and stuff like that, making custom boxes, that's a pretty tough job to get into. It's like building race cars. It's a pretty limited uh, market there. but. Uh, I think, Sam, that you're already working in tech. You have 10 years of admin experience, so therefore you are working in tech. So yes, is the answer to your question. Leo, any advice after finishing your CompTIA A plus book to pursue in studying for the exam? 
Well, you're, you're, you're reading my A-plus book to study for the exam, right? So probably the only thing that you'd absolutely want to do is get a uh, bunch of practice questions and uh, you know, see if you do well on the practice questions. And if you do well, go take the exam. But I don't think that you should finish reading the book. You finish reading the book or referring to it. You read the book, you refer back, do practice questions, refer to chapter 10 or whatever it might be, and then you go take the test. So I, I don't, the, the logic here doesn't work. What you do is before you buy the book, you set a date in the future upon which you will take the test and you spend the money and you say, I will take the test three months in the future, four months in the future, whatever it might be. So you take those, um, then you go ahead and you uh, start studying. <laughs> so there is no finishing the book. You finish the book the day you're done with the A+, plus, and you put it on your bookshelf, and you look at it longingly and think, ah, oh, that Mike Myers, he was a great author. Oh, gosh. How many modules do I have for Linda A plus two two zero one thousand? I don't know. Scott Journey, you can look that up for you. I, I don't remember how many modules there are. Quite a few. Robert Revis, where'd you go? Where, I just saw him. Would you say that it's worth it to just go for the CCNA if you are already studying for the Net Plus, or would you do the Net Plus and then possibly the CCNA? Uh, for most people. It would be, I'm not a big fan of going straight from nothing into CCNA. The, the challenge is, is Cisco does a lot of stuff the Cisco way, and I think it'll turn you into a Cisco head, which is fine. You should be, almost anybody who's in anything about system building should probably have a good chunk of Cisco underneath their belt. Uh, the, the, the trick is, is Cisco looks at some stuff which is, in my opinion, kind of weird. Whereas CompTIA Net Plus looks at it in a more vendor neutral way. And uh, so I, I'm always tempted to go that route and stick with uh, Net Plus and then CCNA. Allison Ledoux, I'm sorry, Windows. Okay, so you want me to do a, what was the term you used, Allison? I should have written it down. System, what was it? I'm gonna, hang on, Allison, I'm gonna find it, what you said before. Going to take a little dig in here. Restore system settings. Okay, I, give me an example of a setting you're talking about. Are you talking about restoring the resolution of the monitor? I think what you're trying to say here, Allison, is that you're trying to restore a, syst a window system back to whatever it was before. And in that case, uh, you're you're going to uh, probably the best thing to do is just throw in the repair disk and. Uh, let it either do its magic, or if you've been taking, God, why do I forget simple words these days? When you take a snap of your system, you take a, I'm gonna see if Scott Jernigan's listening here. No, 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 no. If you take a, oh, come on, guys. We all have done this. I take a boot of my system, and then I can restore from a, what is the magic word I'm looking for? Snapshot, thank you. Whew, that was driving me crazy. <clears throat> so anyway, so probably, Allison, the way you do it is you don't really restore system settings because there's 45 trillion settings in a Windows system, the vast majority of which are stored in the registry. And uh, so that's where I would bring it back from. KS02 Buhler, I am planning AWS admin. I have done A-plus and what other certs you think where I can go after that? Uh, I really think that you ought to take a look at uh, Net Plus and then probably, uh, got to say it, CompTIA Cloud Plus is really starting to turn into something. Uh, Joshua Lobotsky, hi Mike, I started your A-plus course and I am almost finished with your Net Plus course. I'm only 20 years old. I don't know much about IT, but you've learned me a lot. Glad to have done that, Joshua. I am scared because I started working in an IT company. I don't know if I will get this stuff right. Joshua, you will get stuff wrong. You know what? Join the club. I have destroyed millions of dollars worth of equipment, software, and people's hard work 
over the years. And you know what? Nobody gives you any trouble about it because we've all been there and just, you know, try not to do any harm, but sometimes it happens. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to I'm going to stop those questions. I really did get a lot of questions about printers, and uh, so um, let's talk about printers for a little bit. In particular, uh, the question that hit me was, you know, Mike, I'm doing all these uh, printer questions, and how do I know how to tell what's wrong? And the answer is on the CompTIA, we're really talking A+, primarily the 1002 exam, is uh, the questions they're going to ask you, uh, when well, we're talking about physical problems, and I think that that was uh, the, the question that uh, Joey, Joey had, was, you know, I've got a dot matrix printer and it's doing that, what's the problem? I've got a laser printer and it's doing this, what's the problem? So let's go ahead and do a quick, in fact, it's not going to be a quick review, we're probably going to spend possibly the next hour, or at least 45 minutes doing printers. So let's do printers a little bit here, kids. I'm going to try to keep the chat window up while I'm doing this, but no guarantees. So the other thing you got to keep in mind is that uh, I think that the printer questions that CompTIA has are marvelous. Printers are a real thing out there, folks, and show me an office that doesn't have printers. They all have printers. So uh, let's take a look and make sure you understand the types of printers that you're going to see on the exam. So let's start with what we call impact printers. All right, so when we're talking about an impact printer, these are the dot matrix printers and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, they're going to be, first of all, you're going to have uh, a platen, which is a rolling or sometimes a flat piece of metal that sits in the background. You're going to have a print head, and that print head moves back and forth. Inside that print head are a bunch of little pins, and uh, they're shaped in like a matrix, kind of like on an old school basketball scoreboard, and that's how we shape different letters and numbers. And then we have an old school uh, ribbon, and the pins hit the ribbon, which then hits the paper, which then makes a type of image. Now I want you to look at this for a little bit. Now imagine if that platen adjustment had got out of whack. Uh, and the platen is further away on the left side than it is on the right. In that situation, you're probably going to be talking about pieces of paper where it's blank and then it suddenly prints. Or then it prints and then it's suddenly blank. It's because that platen moves back and forth. Uh, what if you've got um, a bunch of letters where the tops or the bottoms of each letter is torn out? Well, that could be something as simple as a print head that's not adjusted. So these are just simple types of questions, and these are known types of questions that you'll run into. And if you just understand how the printers work, you're going to get right through these types of questions easy peasy. What if it's white all the time on a, on a dot matrix printer? Well, you probably need to change the ribbon. They're just that easy. Don't make them hard. All right, now an inkjet printer is a bit of a different animal. So when we look at an inkjet printer, what we've got is a print head caddy that moves back and forth. You've got some kind of traverse assembly, which is almost always some kind of belt. You have the print area, which the, the, the entire traverse isn't all the print area. So it's just a, a certain amount of space that uh, is used for the actual printing. Now the problem with uh, inkjet printers is that most of the issues that we run into are well known. When we look at an inkjet printer, we'll have individual nozzles that are shooting out uh, ink, and then we have some type of device. In this particular example, they're actually charged droplets that move around, and then that's what actually creates the spray look that we have with inkjet printers. In fact, the, the term we see a lot, well, we used to see a lot, was the term bubble jet because that's really what was doing is you had a little piezoelectric device on the end and it would boil and the ink would shoot onto the piece of paper like that. So the big issues you're going to be running into with ink jets more than anything else is the uh, notorious problem with clogging. And uh, whenever you run into clogging, the big fix for that more than anything else is that all ink jets come with some kind of uh, maintenance 
program that usually comes through a piece of software. You can run that. And basically all it's doing is try to clean uh, and unclean the individual inkjet wells. Um, that, that's usually the biggest type of question you're going to see on inkjet printers more than anything else. My personal opinion is don't buy inkjet printers. I hate them. I really hate them. All right, the next one is thermal printers. Thermal printers just use heat, all right? There's no impact, they just make heat. And by uh, making heat, they make an image. We've seen thermal printers, they're real popular in restaurants for uh, all kinds of different stuff, you know, like little the white and yellow pieces of paper, those are all thermal printers. Now, the problems we run into thermal printers more than anything else, it's not that the printers themselves are bad, it's just that the, uh, yeah, if the thermal printer breaks, you just buy a new one, they're, they're dirt cheap. Um, but thermal has some real weaknesses. For example, another set of questions you might run into on CompTIA is what, what would be the best for archiving, you know, laser, thermal, dot matrix. So I'll let you uh, answer that question yourself. Your thermal, if you hold a match to it or even take a thermal and put it in your hands, it's going to just disappear. It's going to go all black on you. So probably not the best archive tool out there. But the one everybody likes to talk about are laser printers. So let's, let's take a minute and make sure we understand how laser printers work. Whoops. How about that? There we go. All right. So when you take a look at a laser printer, uh, what I've got over here is uh, this is the toner cartridge itself, but I, I want to stay away from the toner cartridge for a minute. And first of all, understand that we've got a bunch of other devices in there. First of all, you're going to have some kind of printer board that's going to have RAM on it, okay? So when a print job comes into a laser printer, unlike most other types of printers, it's simply stored in memory, and then it goes from the memory of the system, and then it actually is printed out. The other thing you have to watch out for is this high voltage power supply. The only piece of, a, of IT equipment I've ever heard that killed a human being was a laser printer. And this person was doing wildly stupid things. But uh, so be aware that that exists there. We've got all kinds of guides and rollers that move the paper around from one place to the other. And you hit some interesting questions on there. I wasn't going to go into this, but I might as well mention it. Laser printers last forever. Uh, I have a LaserJet 3 or LaserJet 4, I forget that we had for decades a total of seminars. And the thing just, it was a tank. It just ran forever. Um, the big thing with uh, any type of quality printer, I'm not talking about your little home printers, folks. I'm talking about the big, you know, $2,500 printers that you use in offices and such, is that they come with maintenance kits. Uh, these types of printers usually have uh, scheduled maintenance and anything, kind of like your car. And if you keep this up, they last forever. It, it's pretty impressive. You know, little new take-up rollers, uh, little take-up rollers where it grabs the piece of paper and pulls it in. Those things are notorious for gathering paper dander and eventually not working, but most maintenance kits replace those. And you, know, you can hire companies that, you know, they'll keep your printers up and running. Me personally, I kind of like working with printers, so I like to mess with the maintenance kits and putting on new rollers and whatever they want me to do in that kind of case. So it's actually kind of fun. All right, so the big thing I want to talk about, and this is how you're going to get through all of the questions on the CompTIA A+. It was the LaserJet 4. Thank you, Scott. Uh, it's going to help you through the questions on the CompTIA A+, uh, are the, is understanding the laser printing process. So let's go through that. So you basically got seven steps. So we do, we do what's called processing, which creates the image, and then everything else has to do with the photosensitive drum, charging, exposing, developing, transfer, refusing, and cleaning. So let's go through each and every one of those, okay, kids? So processing basically means taking the job that's coming from your print spooler and moving it into the RAM of your system, okay? So the, uh, really what takes place here is that the printer receives some or all of a print job, depending on how you have the printer set up, and then the hardware of the printer actually takes over and actually processes the image. So this can be done by uh, certain printers, like as a, each page rolls in, it'll print it, or it'll store them based on waiting for a paper change, all kinds of stuff like that. And then uh, a memory overflow indicates there's insufficient RAM, 
And for HP LaserJet, that's kind of a famous error. That's the error 21 means the data is too complex, which basically means you need to have more RAM. Come on, what, what was that wonderful movie? Um, it's filmed in Austin, Texas. Office Space. Did anybody see the movie Office Space? I mean, you, you kind of got to watch it. There's this one scene where the guy's like, PC love letter, and he starts beating on the machine. It's talking about that you needed to load a paper cartridge. You needed to load letter-sized paper into it. It's a great movie. Office Space, Jennifer Aniston's first movie. Great movie, you need to watch it. All right, so let's go ahead and go through the actual process. So we've got a print job that's in, in the RAM and we want to print it. So let's talk about that process. So the first thing we have is charging. On every toner cartridge on Earth, if you actually lift the door underneath it, you'll see this colored drum. And uh, it, it, this, this little roller. And this roller is usually kind of pretty. It's going to be kind of green or blue or sometimes yellow. And this is what we call a photosensitive drum. The photosensitive drum works very simply. The more light that hits it, the less charge it holds, okay? So imagine it being full of static charge and wherever you hit it, those little spots don't hold as much charge, okay? So the first step that takes place with charging is you have this thing called your primary corona. The primary corona puts a, now it varies between manufacturers, but for this example, we'll say it puts down a negative 600 volt negative charge. It's a static charge onto this little roller itself. So here's my little primary corona, and what it's doing, this gray area is as completely zero charge, none. And as this thing rotates, it's putting a nice even, in this example, I'm gonna say negative 600 volt charge, okay? So now once that charge is on, now it's time, and there I just circled the primary corona so you can see that. The next thing you know is we're gonna to have to expose it. And here is where we take the ones and zeros out of the RAM and using a laser beam, we begin to shoot light on to the drum itself. So here I have an imaging laser, and this imaging laser is shooting little tiny images, the actual images that we want on our paper. Now, I'm lying to you a little bit here. Do you see where it says A plus guide? That's actually untrue. You can't see if you were somehow be able to look at this while it was happening, you can't see where the laser is hitting it. It's just changing the charge. So instead of being a negative 600 charge, wherever the laser hits it, it'll be maybe a negative 200 charge. So at that moment, you can't see anything on it. I just put that word in there so you kind of get the idea. So once that's done, we then start squirting some toner on that. I've actually cheated. So uh, what we're doing here is this little box is full of toner. Now the toner is going to be pre-negatively charged at let's just say negative 400 volts. So I need you to think about this for a minute. If I've got toner that's at negative 400 volts and there's other places that are even more negatively charged, remember it was initially charged at negative 600, it's going to be repelled from those areas. But wherever the laser hits it, at negative 200, a lower negative charge than the negative charge I have looks like a positive charge. So that toner just goes wham onto the, onto the roller. And it, if I could at that moment somehow put a microscope in there, look, here would be I, the first time I could actually see the letters or the images or what I'm actually trying to print on that laser printer. All right, so now what I've got is a whole bunch of toners stuck to this little photoelectric roller, but we want it on paper, right? I mean, we're laser printing, we want to put it on paper, so we got to go through the process of transfer. So what we do is we have something called a transfer corona. Now the transfer corona is going to put like a positive charge onto the paper. This is important because transfer coronas are notorious for going out. If the transfer corona goes out, the paper's not gonna have enough charge to guarantee 
Because what we're trying to do is we're going to charge the paper with a big positive charge, and then it's going to roll really close, and then all of the lettering and everything is going to come off of the photosensitive drum and onto the paper. So if that doesn't have enough charge, a lot of times it comes out speckly and stuff like that. So that's the transfer Corona's job. Next thing we're going to do is we, we've got it, we have the toner on the paper, but at that point, if I like hit the laser printer really hard, it would shake because it's not really fused into the paper. So that's where we have to go through a fuser. So the fuser rollers apply heat and pressure, and then that is what actually permanently fuses the toner to the paper itself. The problem is, is that piece of paper right now has got a tremendous static cling on it. So what we have to do is run it past the static eliminator, which reduces the vast majority of charge off of it, and then the paper can then come out and we can enjoy the fruits of our printing. So there's the transfer corona. Okay. So then fusing, we've already done fusing. Oh, I had a nice little step inside. Sorry about that, guys. So there we go, we got the all the fusing there. And then the next step is, is we've got to go ahead and clean the photosensitive drum. So what's going to happen here is, number one, we're going to have a cleaning blade. It's just a rubber squeegee. And it scrapes off all of the excess little bits of toner that are stuck on there. And last, we then use the erase lamp, which is going to set it back to a zero charge. And we're ready to start over again at the primary corona. So the important thing to remember with laser printers is that the laser printer, it's not like that, this, this roller is pretty thin. It's maybe, depending on the model, it could be half an inch wide. So all of these processes are happening at the same time. It's not like one versus the other. Now, if you think about this for a little bit, you can get some pretty easy answers for the types of questions you're going to run into the A+. Let's talk about that toner the transfer corona again. If the transfer corona goes out, you're not going to have a real strong attraction of the paper to pull the toner off the photosensitive drum. And in that case, the image will look very, very weak. Uh, it'll look speckly because nothing lands in exactly the right spot. So that could be a problem. Um, if the toner itself doesn't pre-charge, if the toner's sitting at somewhere like around zero charge, remember, it doesn't care whether it's negative 200 or negative 600, it's all a big charge. If the toner doesn't pre-charge, you're printing out black sheets of paper. They're completely printed. Uh, so those are, those are the kinds of things you run into when we're talking about how to deal with printer problems. So I'm going to leave it for there right now because I see a whole bunch of questions pulling up again. And uh, hopefully that, Jolene, gives you some idea <clears throat> Joe, okay, so here we got some, Joe, I see a question, Joe, right here. What does it mean you need to replace the transfer corona? This is one of the cool things about laser printers is that most of the parts are easily replaceable. You can buy parts, just like you buy a new hard drive or a new power supply for your system. It's fairly trivial to buy parts. You can get them online all kinds of places. Uh, I usually go to Amazon or eBay to buy parts for printers. Uh, clean and calibrate it. Uh, I don't believe the transfer corona is go through a cleaning or calibration process. There are situations in a laser printer where as a laser printer just gets dirty, uh, you go ahead and have to clean it with a special, can't use a regular Hoover vacuum, that thing's full of static and it can really mess everything up, so you use an anti-static vacuum to go in there and clean it up. I will tell you that I've almost never used, even though there's CompTIA questions of that effect, I've almost never used an anti-static vacuum. For me, most of the time, if a printer gets really dirty, I'm using a, a can of air, and I'm taking it outside the parking lot, and I'm blowing it down to get excess toner out. Uh, I've also had toners that shatter. Uh, I'm a big believer. Uh, for inkjets, I don't mind using third-party uh, cartridges because they don't have that long of a life anyway. But for lasers, I tend to want to stick with the manufacturer's printers because those toners just tend to be better. Uh, the only toner, I've had toners explode on me on multiple occasions. And in every case, those toners were third party. That's my opinion. CompTIA is not going to quiz you on that. And you get toner bombs. Oh, toner bomb, oh, toner bomb. And it turns everything in the room pitch black. It's terrible, it's messy, and you end up having to 
repaint and pull carpet and stuff like that. Mike, then we will just, this is Javier, change parts of a printer. We will never do electronic repairs, right? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I'm not familiar with anybody doing electronic repairs on printers themselves. I've seen system boards replaced. Uh, usually in that case, we're talking about a pretty high-end printer where it's worth the time and energy to do that. Uh, and usually there's something pretty obvious. You know, the printer's turning on and absolutely nothing's coming up on the display or something like that that tells me there's something really, really naughty happening. Allison Ledoux, is there a demand for printer technicians? Yes, yes there are. If yes, what are the requirements and pay scale? Thanks. Allison, I can never really talk about pay scale because I don't know where you live. Uh, New York City is gonna be a lot better than uh, Huntsville, Alabama, just you know that type of thing. Um, usually probably $15 an hour in general, not for New York City, but for regular places, that would probably be a starting scale. Uh, you're going to be traveling a lot. A lot of times I'll give you a van, you know, good training like that. Uh, printer companies tend to give amazing training to their new employees. Just, you know, look at, uh, type whatever town you live in and type printer repair. You'll find it. Or find your local HP uh, shop, you know, HP repairs. Find out where you have to go to drop off your HP printer to get it fixed and go over there and ask for a job. It's not complicated. Whoa, toner exploded, what happened? Uh, it was, they were cheap, they were cheap third party uh, toner cartridges and uh, I got a good deal on them and I ran them for a while and basically, you know, keep in mind that photosensitive drum is in there and there's things that kind of hold the toner in and one of them just blew out and it was very exciting. That's happened more than once. All right, I'm gonna scroll back up. Tom sent the wrong email. Okay, we'll get you there, buddy. C plus, I've thrown more inkjet cartridges away. I've thrown away more inkjet printers. I, I'm really anti inkjets. Does Messer give great labs too? Good for him. It's always a good idea. Uh oh, Scumba Naughty there, Scott. Did you have to bleed him out? <laughs> Scott, I'm really checking my teams, I swear to God. Um, my HP 6600 inkjet printer will not take cheaper in cartridges, only original ones. Why? Uh, I believe HP is one of those folks that just won't let you do that. They actually put uh, a little bit of smarts into their cartridges saying they have to say they're legit. Be why, Thomas Robinson? Because they want to make your money. You know, most inkjet uh, printers are cheap. Tolowit. Hey, Tolowit. It's the first time I've seen you today. Back when I did tech support work for Tandy. You work for Tandy? Uh, we had to get individual certifications from company on their printers. Yeah, in fact, a lot of people argue that the first certification came from Hewlett Packard. Office Space was a great movie. Laser printer drum can burn you. I don't think the drum can burn you, but the primary corona will knock you on your rear end. Uh, the transfer, uh, the fuser assembly will definitely be able to burn you. Javier, let's talk to Scott Jern again. I'll assume Scott Jern, there you go. You got Scott's email. Mm. Geraldine, yeah, we got you there. That question's already answered. When does the coloring happen? Yeah, I'm sorry. Those images that I showed, the one side it came out color, that, that, that's inaccurate. I, I should have fixed that. I was moving fast. These images are actually designed for black and white books, and I grabbed them quick for my buddy Geraldine, and I didn't notice some of the bits of color. So really, uh, color laser printers uh, basically will have multiple drums of toner, and one piece of paper will run through four different drums, C, M, Y, K, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And it just runs through uh, each four of those drums and uh, makes the image. So it does what we just did there four times. Uh, Javier, it, it, it is not necessary to do electronics course in the future. 
I think that's been the case for a long time. Uh, I mean, everything in IT that I'm aware of is reduced to a field replaceable unit or FRU that you yank out and put back together. Um, I'm not afraid of a soldering iron, but um, once in a while, maybe I'll fix a power supply uh, that's gone bad. Back in the old days, I wasn't afraid of fixing the occasional CRT. Um, but yeah, electronics in, in our world, the problem is, is electronics are just too expensive. I mean, we're talking about individual systems that for the most part, at least in terms of individual components, that cost less than 200 bucks. And once a component is less than 200 bucks, the most expensive part of repairing it is you, not the actual thing itself. So, yeah. Uh, the, the days of uh, great skills in uh, capacitors and things like that are kind of over, at least in terms of making money. Oh, there Scott gave Allison a nice answer. See, Plasma, so far I bought three different HP printers and have replaced the pickup rollers, yep. Printers were worth over $1,000 but bought on eBay for 100 bucks with a 35 rebuild kit, yep. Allison Ledoux, you really live in New York City. Yeah, you already told me that, didn't you? I'm sorry, Allison. Um, yes. So Geraldine Bird is saying you definitely need A+. I have not looked in that for a while, Geraldine, so I'll trust you, uh, you on that. <laughs> Free thinking mind. Is it worth it to get a master's degree in computer networking? I'm unfamiliar with a school that provides that type of program. I'd love to hear about it. I'm focused on starting more with networking and eventually focus on cybersecurity. Goodness. Uh, Free thinking mind? Again, I'd have to ask the same question. What do you want to be when you grow up? I mean, if you're talking about a master's degree, that tells me you probably already have a bachelor's. Why aren't you just going to work? You're hireable, I promise, you know? Uh, why would you want to start more with networking and then eventually focus on cybersecurity? Well, I, I, I want to know where your brain is on this. Here, free thinking mind, send me an email. I'm very curious to hear your, your logic here. I want to help. And uh, the answer is, is you need to go to work. Got to work, got to work, got to work. And uh, send me an email, please, please, please. And uh, we can talk about this in more detail uh, as you get the opportunity. Tyler R. Hey, thanks. Uh, you were past your A plus, Net plus, and Security plus. And, oh, I thought it said five minutes. I was extremely impressed, Tyler R. Five months. Hey, congratulations, man. Well done. Yes, Gino, we know we use cold water. <laughs> There's no questions on the CompT exams that ask about toner bombs. Well, I think there should be. There's a smart chip in my, yeah, it's a, some kind of chip. Yeah. Best affordable laptop right now, Navit Kaur. Uh, man, so a lot of times when I'm, for, I'm going, when I buy laptops, if I need something a little bit more robust, I'll tend to use the Dell refurbished website. They offer wonderful refurbished Dells that you can't tell from brand new uh, at great deals. Uh, for the lower end, like to the five to six hundred dollar end, which to me is about as low as you can get with a laptop without going into you know weird things um, like Chromebooks. Um, Acer has been making a good series of very inexpensive laptops, uh, sitting usually around Core i fives, quarter to a half terabyte SSDs in them, eight gigs of RAM, run ten eighty just fine. Uh, shared low-end video cards, but you know, as long as you're doing like browsing and stuff like that, they work great. What's the best laser printer to buy? Hewlett Packard. What are some good jo Josiah White? What are some good certs to get into security? I am currently taking courses for A plus, Net plus, Security plus, CEH, and CND. You already got them covered there, brother. You literally, you got them started. Now get some work. I don't know, about the only place I'm aware of where a security company will hire people fresh 
without any experience is a lot of these online monitoring companies. So you set up a virtual website or something like that, and then you pay a little extra money to get you know humans to monitor, to make sure you're not being hacked or a DDoS attack or whatever it might be. And I do know of companies that hire people off the street with uh, no experience. Uh, it's tough work, but, it, and it'll, but it'll get you moving forward. Um, if you don't mind working the midnight to late shift, because that's what they'll start going. Free thinking mind, can we move past printers? We have moved past printers, sir. I am here to answer the questions that are asked. Aaron Falco, hi Mike, how are you? I'm good, Aaron, how are you, brother? Polly, will you be covering network for 1001 in the future? That's what I'm struggling the most with. Uh, Polly, I'm here to answer whatever questions you guys have. I've had a number of people ask about printers, so we talk about printers. So <clears throat> if you want to call, cover networking for 1001, uh, we can cover it. We've got 40 minutes left in uh, this session, so ask me a question. And don't ask me, tell me about networking, because <laughs> it's like, uh, don't do that to me. But I mean, ask a particular question. I'm assuming you've read stuff, and you know, there's a certain point where you didn't have understanding. So ask me, like, well, Mike, I was reading about um, these IP addresses, and they have three dots, or something like that. You know, why is it? So I, I give me a place to start. Lenovo's are great, too. Uh, what about, what, what kind of desktop am I going to be buying, Allison? brand name. I usually build my own these days. Uh, I just like building them. Uh, it's more, it's fun for me. I enjoy the process. You could probably save money these days buying systems, uh, but I always build my own desktops. Josiah White, you have four years IT experience in the Marines and in my current job. Josiah, you got you four years as a jarhead? Dude, there are so many organizations out there to get you guys hired. Uh, you know, I, I would, uh, I, I understand that the coronavirus is an issue right now. It is, but in general, uh, when I hear people who can't find a job, usually it's gonna be, there's plenty of jobs out there, I don't like them. That's one I hear a lot. Uh, the other one is, uh, The, the other one that gets me is I won't move out of my little town or I can't move out of my little town and there's no jobs in my little town. Uh, the other one is, is I don't want to go apply for jobs because I'm locked into thinking that I have to have all these certifications. So those are three things I want you guys to watch out for when you're considering getting a job. I'm not saying you're doing that. I'm just saying these are three things I hear. Joseph Fisher, why is Mac better for video editing? Joseph Fisher, I wouldn't necessarily agree that Macs are better for video editing. They're very popular for video editing, but like for example, at Total Seminars, we do use Macs primarily as our video editors, but that's primarily because we've got a couple of video production people who think that way, so we kind of stick with it. Uh, but we use Adobe Creative Cloud, which works wonderfully both on Windows and on Macs. So I would have to disagree with you in terms of it works better. The other thing I can do on a Windows system is I can pack a lot more RAM in it than you can ever pack into any prepackaged uh, big uh, Apple machine. C Plasma in 2009, you mentioned you were going to touch on IP addressing. The problem is, C Plasma, as I'm still not getting, and I, and I have it from Monday, I have that you wanted to talk about that. I, I still need a little bit more development. Yes, I read your email. I'm, 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 I'm trying to put that together a little bit. The problem is, is if for me to start talking about IP addressing, uh, I, I'd literally have to start at the absolute beginning of time where we'd have to use cavemen and clubs and search for fire. I'm kidding, but uh, I'm, 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 I, I was, Hoping we get a few more uh, detailed on that. So I, I'm, I'm ducking you a little bit, but not a lot. I promise we'll get there. Diana Murray, I have an MIS degree. I've been told I am overqualified. Yep, uh, that that can be an issue, Diana. Uh, Dina, Diana.
Tolit, what are your thoughts on all-in-one laser printers? I tend to like printers that just print. If I want to scan or copy, I get them separately. Am I being silly? No. Uh, I, I'm kind of the same way, Tolawood. I like to have all my stuff separate. Uh, when I eat, I got little segmenters in my plate to keep the peas away from the mesh. I'm kidding. But um, I find that most multifunction printers are hard to get them to do any one thing well. They also tend to have weird interfaces and feature sets that aren't intuitive. Uh, it's not to say they don't work. Uh, we've got one of Total Seminars we've used for years, but we had to sit there and figure the darn thing out. But I, I tend to agree with you. Oh, sorry, guys. Tyler R., what kind of IT job companies do you think are good for people to apply for that only have help desk and network operations experience to take the next step in their career? Well, Tyler, usually at this point, I mean, you, you, gotta, you have to know the answer to that question. What's interesting to you? I mean, where do you want to go next? Do you, do you, do you want to start working for some office and being the administrator for a large Microsoft Active Directory? Does that sound good? I like that stuff. Uh, do you want to uh, get in a truck and fix printers? You know. Uh, do, you, do you want to start getting more into the router world, start working at data centers? But I'll tell you, one of the easier jobs to get these days is Amazon hires like crazy for AWS data centers. And uh, you know the problem is they're invariably in far-flung places that are inconvenient to people. Uh, but they're hiring like crazy. So uh, the, the question you have to say is, Tyler is what do you want to do? What sounds interesting to you? And you know, and to keep in mind, <clears throat> this doesn't have to be a permanent answer. So you've been doing help desk stuff, and and you know, you've got network operations. So I guess that means you've been working in some of the big buildings. And uh, so then you decide what's interesting. If let's say you make a choice on something, then you end up not liking it. The most beautiful thing about IT is that we jump jobs all the time. It's not that big of a deal. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's not like you get locked into something. Don't be afraid to try something. Give it a couple of years. You don't like it, go and find something else. <clears throat> Give it six months. I see somebody who's in IT for less than 10 years, and if they don't have a number of jobs on their resume, that actually makes me nervous sometimes. I like to see people who are moving around. That shows me that they're growing within the industry and they're, they're learning where their place is. Yeah, guys, the problem is, is everybody's, everybody who's in the I'm having trouble getting a job scenario is so different. I, I almost have to do them individually. And I'll do, I'll do what I can. Free thinking mind. Yes, please do. Send me an email. So Tyler R., the other thing you got to worry about, a lot of the jobs I find want crazy qualifications. Tyler, I have never applied and got a job that I had all the qualifications for. Have a chunk of the qualifications. You don't have to have them all. Just go for it. You, you, you know, the problem is, is that if you go for just the jobs that you have the qualifications for, you, you're never going. You're, you're going to have a hard time. Don't be afraid to push yourself in a little bit. Now, look. Don't lie. You know, when you, you know, don't pretend that you have a qualification you don't have. But if you can segue something, if you can kind of, you know, that's kind of that qualification, don't be afraid to say that. As long as you understand within a technical interview or something like that, you're going to have to say, well, I kind of felt that was a qualification. Also, you can be in an interview, no, I don't have that particular qualification. But i got to be honest with you, Mr. Hirer, when you look at the overall scope of this job and what you're requiring for, I'm an obvious candidate for it. Granted, I may be missing X, Y, and Z, but I have enough of the core understanding of this job that I think I would be a perfect person for this position. Boy, doesn't that sound good? Navid Kwar, my current laptop is extremely slow. I've tried all the basic techniques to fix it. Did you hit it on the side? <laughs> Navid Kwar, what model of laptop is it? How much RAM is in it? What kind of storage do you have? What operating system are you running? How long have you run that operating system? Are there particular applications that you're running that are uh, a bigger problem? What type of anti-malware have you run as of late? You know, so Navid, 
I can't answer Navneet. I, I'd really like to try to pronounce people's names properly. I apologize. So, I mean, give me a lot more information here. Navneet, here you go. Send me an email. Tell me all about that laptop. Let's get some details in here. And we can talk, that would be a great question to cover here in class. So send me an email and uh, we'll bring it up here on the next AMA so that we can, uh, you know, answer it as a group. We got some pretty sharp cookies in here. I mean, I, 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 I may claim all this alpha geek stuff, but the reality is, is uh, none of you guys have told seminars, Michael Smyre, Dave Rush, Scott Jernigan, they're all fine techs into themselves. But we've got some names here, some of these guys who've been coming time and time again, who actually proven themselves to have a pretty good skill base themselves. So please, let, let's, that sounds like, that'd be a great question. A plus covers lots of, of uh, laptop type questions. Let's do it there, it'd be more fun. Zaloom, Zaloom. What are certain characteristics you wish were more prevalent in the cybersecurity industry? Certain characteristics. It's an interesting question. I think it's the same, are you talking about personal characteristics about the people who are in that industry? I find the cybersecurity industry to be a pretty fun group of folks in general. I mean, who else has Black Hat for crying out loud for a conference? Um, I, I, I like it, I think communication is good. Um, what, what would I see more of? So, Lou, I can't think of anything. I, I, I like that crowd of folks. I think they're fun. C Plus, man, I'm sorry, brother. And, hey, and don't be afraid to press me on questions. I, I have no problem with that. I, uh, the problem is I misplaced my phone, C Plasman, that had your question in it, and I just forgot it. That, that's it's like what I tell the IRS every year. Justin Miller, I earned my A plus and was able to get off government assistance programs finally last year. You interned at a local PC, at a local PC? Uh, not sure what that is. And some college coursework. Okay, cool. Well, hey, Justin, glad to see you up there rolling, man. That's the most important thing. C Plasma, does the governing body, I'm assuming it was a PIPA, only delegate five addresses to a multinational organization? Okay, so a PIPA is not, a, a PIPA is automatically programmable IP address. It's not a government organization, it's a standard. Only delegate five addresses to a multinational organization. Five addresses, no. Okay, so it's the IE Scott. Did, oh, thank God, Scott has the answers for me. So you have the IANA, the Internet Authorized Numbering Authority, which stored all of the IPv4s back in the day. Those were then passed out to regional authorities, you know, like AfriNIC, Asia NIC. Uh, I forget what RIPE, I think, was the one that was in the United States. Don't hold me to that one. So these regional authorities then were passed out all of the IPv4 addresses. Um, IANA ran out of them 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, well, 10 years ago. So it's just the regional authorities. Most of the regional authorities have run out. There's not five. It's what was there based on demands and things. Uh, some of the Class A's were passed out a little bit more carefully out of fairness. But it ended up that uh, even the regional authorities, they had to rob Peter to pay Paul. After Nick lost some of their Class A's, I think they were pushed over to Asia. I forget, this is older information. So, uh, so, so there is no multinational organization per se, unless you're describing the ANA and the regional authorities. But <clears throat> even the regional authorities are for all intents and purposes out of IPv4 addresses. Most of those have already been passed down to internet service providers, which are now nickel and diming them to death in a very, very small way. How far can these addresses be broken down for individual sites? All the way down to a WAC 30, dude. 
You can start with a WAC 8 and subnet that into two WAC 9s and subnet that into 64 WAC 23. You know what I mean? They can all the way down. So you can just keep going and going. This hair, Paul. Hey, Mike, me and my friend Pauly, our student, hey, I remember Pauly, taking the A+. Plus. We were planning on studying majoring in cybersecurity in college and are wondering if the A+, plus is important for a career in security. No, the A+, plus is not important for a, secure, a career in security. But again, my question is, is this, what are you going to do? There's very few security companies that just hire people with no IT experience. There are a few spots, but they're few and far between. Usually, most security people come from the general IT world. Uh, people who've been doing system support, uh, people doing system repairs, uh, people who are doing you know, that kind of stuff. And you, you take the skills. Uh, to be in any type of security, in my opinion these days, requires an understanding of TCP IP that you know, is pretty challenging. So um, that I, I would think that you really need to consider, you know, you don't necessarily have to take A+, plus, but maybe even Network+, plus to get you in some basic entry-level networking type jobs. Have you run the CPU B Plaster? Oh, he's talking to me. <laughs> Oscar, thanks for all, Mr. Mike, no problem. Giveaway today. No, no giveaway today, Jolene, I'm sorry, Ben. So we were giving away these uh, $25 gift certificates to ThinkGeek. Uh, what was the other name? I forgot already. Uh, Games, GameSpot. And we're having trouble getting them to provide the gift certificates. So we've kind of stopped on that temporarily. Uh, I'm waiting to hear back from our sales department and uh, we will get some answers on that. How many certifications do you need to get a job as a technician at AWS Data Center or one of those entry level? Uh, I have a four year degree at college in an unrelated field. Probably any of the first level AWS certs would uh, almost certainly get you in the door. Hope you, hope you understand IPv4 and stuff like that. Understand basic cloud, basic virtualization. What kind of technician would you be if you can't fix your own laptop? I hear you there, man. Now send me an email. For networking, can you tell me something important I should know for protocols? Okay, Paulie, I'm going to tease you a little bit. Which protocols? Are we talking about IP protocols? Are we talking about wireless protocols? Or are we talking about protocols for HTTPS? Uh, you know what I mean? You've got to be careful when you say the word protocols, okay? I think you mean applications, but I'm going to hold you to that a little bit so you can think about it. And Geraldine, I accept hardware. Always a, tri always a tricky one, though. Yeah, Henry, GameStop is, is my, a failing company, but boy, they, have, they sell a lot of fun toys that make for great giveaways, so I'm very frustrated we can't uh, give something away. We're, we're working on it very, very quickly. Thomas Robinson, is the cloud safe? It absolutely is safe. You bet it is, man. What's the most important for 1001? The most important, understand all your different parts, connections, and how they look. A lot of questions on the 1001 that says, what is this? You need to be able to recognize what they are and what they do. All right. All right, I'm, I'm gonna grab my phone. <laughs> Just things been sitting six feet away from me the entire time. My phone is social distancing. Uh, did I call somebody, babe? Sorry, babe. Uh, I'm trying to find that question. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Mm. 
Oh, no, I'm just trying to find the question. Hang on. All right. So what, we got 40 minutes. Questions kind of slowed down. Okay, guys, let's do this. All right. I'm not going to name any names, but here's a good question that came in uh, yesterday, I believe. So here's a person who asked to uh, go into a place. And the problem is, is they've got Wi-Fi in the place. In place, they weren't getting Wi-Fi coverage. So this tech had to find out why the Wi-Fi didn't reach another part of the building. He discovered that she had bad placement of the second uh, Wi-Fi repeater slash router and wanted me to ex install an extender, but it kept dropping signal after I moved it. Okay. When you're dealing with wireless, all of a sudden, we're talking about, this isn't somebody's home. We're talking about a building that needs to be wired professionally. You can't, you can't just add a bunch of home devices into an enterprise environment and hope for the goodness. The big thing that's gonna happen here more than anything else is the idea of Wi-Fi extenders or wireless bridges or any of that, they're all universally garbage. Yeah, if you take the Network Plus, make sure you know what one is. It's basically a WAP, but instead of uh, taking a signal from the internet and broadcasting it out, it takes a wireless signal and shoots it out through the Ethernet. Um, I've had nothing but bad luck with it my entire life. When you're in a real building, you wire the building. You run cable. You set up a main distribution frame in a closet someplace, and you put a patch panel in there, and you put a switch in there, and you run your CAT 6A, and if you can't do it, hire companies, they'll do it for 100 to $200 per drop, per position you want, and they will run the cables. Uh, if you have concrete walls, they can work around that, or you, you know, there's all this stuff, they know how to do it. And you put your wireless access points in proper locations based on the version of wireless you have. You set them up based on the type of space you're using that helps you to find the type of antenna and WAP you install. Generally these little flying saucer looking WAPs that you put into on the drop ceilings in multiple places work great. Uh, there are no Wi-Fi extenders, there's no under that junk. Uh, and the other thing is, is this stuff's not expensive. Ten years ago I would have said something very different, but now if you look at companies like Ubiquity who sell amazing uh, enterprise level wireless equipment and you throw out all this home junk and you do it the right way. And uh, that is always going to be the, the right fix for that. Even in homes, I got to be honest with you today, um, it's hard for me, especially if you have the skill set, to rationalize just throwing in little home routers. I mean, this guy over here is cute and all, but he's really designed for a home or a small office and just putting in the higher quality stuff. But that always means you're going to have to run cable. It always means you're going to have to run cable. Well, about uh, seven or eight years ago in my house, I had all the walls ripped out. All of these walls were gone. And I ran Cat 6, I think it was just 6 back then. Uh, and it's been wonderful for me. And uh, running cable is not the hardest thing you've ever had to do. Um, the Network Plus does a great job about teaching people uh, CompTIA doesn't want to turn you into a cable installer. What CompTIA wants you to be able to do is understand what it means to install structured cable so that you can talk to cable installers and not sound like an idiot. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's really the way you fix that type of situation. A uh, person who asked, you know, don't, don't mess with extenders, don't mess with that stuff. Pull cables and do it right and you'll be in good shape. Because as long as you keep trying to fix that mess, that's all you're going to do is have a mess that you're trying to fix. All right, I am out of questions for the day. So I'm going to keep going. We've got about 15 minutes left. So I will keep going until the questions run out or 4 o'clock my time, whichever comes first.
Geraldine, are we buffering again? I actually did get a little warning for about 30 seconds that we were buffering and then it went away, so I'm guessing we're okay. Uh, here we go. Greg Davis. <clears throat> My son got the IT certs in high school through Votech. Greg, I'm gonna tease you. The certs? Uh, and is about to graduate with BS Computer Science with focus on cybersecurity. Okay, I'm still advised to get him certified in Security Plus, uh, CYSA, et cetera. Good idea? Probably. Uh, what I'd be really interested in is what is his school doing to help him get a job? Uh, you know, one of the biggest reasons we go to school, and even with a four-year university, job placement is really, really important. Uh, I would still think that uh, picking up a few of those certs would be pretty easy for a guy like him, considering he's gone through a, a bachelor's program with a focus on cybersecurity. Uh, yeah, I think it'd be a good idea. Justin Miller, can you help me understand the difference between cores versus threads? Sure, we can talk about that. Okay, so let's go to move into, uh, move into A plus land. So basically, a program is a piece of software uh, that sits on your computer, on your hard drive, okay? And when you start a program, uh, really what you're doing is you're pulling out chunks of, the, like when you double click on Word, all of the ones and zeros that sit in your hard drive that make Word, they're not all instantly loaded, okay? Uh, what they do is you take certain chunks that are important and you put that into RAM. Now the program is running. But what's really running are what we call processes. So a process is the piece of code that's actually in RAM that is either being executed at the moment or is ready to be executed while other things are happening. And so then you take that process, and then the process itself is low, the CPU begins to grab chunks of the process, and these individual chunks of the process are known generically as threads. So the thread is the smallest piece of programming that your computer can run at a time. Now, back in the old days, individual threads were run through a, a computer one at a time. But what we discovered, you know, starting as early as 20 years ago, oh good lord, Pentium computer, 1930 years ago, I'm old, I'm so old, um, we began to come up with the idea of, number one, it was called pipelining. So pipelining would take an incoming thread, okay, and get it through some processes and then get it out the other end processed, whatever it needed to do, you know, say, add two plus two, okay, done, four, uh, move memory, okay, done, and we'll do these one at a time through these pipelines. But uh, starting around 1990, we began to come up with CPUs that could have multiple pipelines. And uh, so you'd have all of these different individual pipelines that could handle multiple threads at a time. The problem is, is that you can only have so many pipelines, whatever the technology allows, and they can only get so fast. So speed has always been a big issue. And starting around maybe 20 years ago, uh, we began to come up with the idea of making multiple cores. So let's set cores aside for a minute and instead concentrate on the concept of pipeline. So when you have a pipeline running, you can, if you have four pipelines, you can run four threads at a time. So that speeds things up. Uh, but there's only one thread per pipeline. Now, Intel got pretty cool, and they came up with a way that you could actually take both, you could put more than one thread in a pipeline at a time, which was known as hyper-threading, and hyper-threading basically makes one CPU look like two CPUs. So that was pretty cool. But the other thing we do is we began to run out of time, I mean, it ran through speed issues and such, because like the Pentium 4s were designed to be running at six, seven gigahertz, which is a speed we still haven't even got to. We're running into quantum mechanics problems. Um, all of a sudden, you know, one of these tiny little transistors would go disappear and show up on Pluto. Quantum mechanics joke. And uh, so because we were running out of the ability to have speed, but we had a lot of these transistors, the smaller and smaller processes took place, we're like, okay, if we can't make them faster, let's make two CPUs in one CPU box. So those are known as cores. So an individual core 
uh, is almost like a CPU. Now cores don't have their own, uh, there's a lot of stuff they don't have. Uh, they're not gonna have their own caches, for example. Uh, a CPU will have big level one, level two, maybe level three cache, and the individual cores share that. And uh, that's just the, the, the nature of the beast these days. So cores are like individual CPUs. Does that help? So when you ask a question like that, you're we're almost kind of like different animals. Terrence Tech, Mike, do you have? I do. Kim.net, Ubiquity. Thank you for spelling that out for me. I appreciate it. There's no U in Ubiquity, Dave Rush? I thought there was. Mike, do you have your own home built data racks? No, not here at the house. I, uh, I don't. You mean like 19 inch equipment racks? <clears throat> I had one for a while that I used for a home theater system, which I'm not using anymore. So basically, my, uh, my main distribution frame is some home based patch panels and switches that I have screwed onto a piece of plywood in a closet, which for me is sufficient. I've only got like six drops in the entire house. And most of those drops are really servicing wireless access points. <laughs> How are we doing on time? Doing great. CP1234 5737. Hey Mike, I just took my core 2A plus and missed the mark by 40 points. Ah, sorry dude. All right, first of all, everybody fails certification exams. It's not that big of a deal. This is not an SAT, okay? So yeah, it's disappointing. Yeah, you're gonna have to reset it. Yeah, you gotta pay more money. But number one, don't let it melt your brain, okay? I'm Mike Myers, Alpha Geek. I probably fail one third of all the certification exams I've ever taken. So be cool, all right? It's a minor inconvenience, a minor irritation, a minor dip into your wallet. But other than that, that's all it is. We all retake exams. It's not a big deal. Uh, the A plus, they asked a bit about TKIP versus AES. Okay, pretty sure I covered TKIP and AES, but I'm gonna write that down, uh, CP. CP, I want you to send me an email, man. C CP1234537, this is for you. CP, send me an email, I wanna talk to you, man. It's very, very important I talk to you. I'm just writing some notes here. Okay, CP, will you send me an email, please? Please, 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 please send me an email. I want to talk to you. Okay. Matt H, hi Mike, let me rephrase. Finish your A plus one. Shall I study the content for exam two now or do the exam first and start studying for two? <clears throat> For decades, I've always said you take both tests together, but I will say that uh, for the first time, uh, for the first time, you can probably, I, I can say that you can study for one A plus exam, take it, and then study for the other exam and take it. So the answer is go ahead and uh, just take the exam now and uh, we'll get her. Jacob Edwards, can you explain what a link local IPv6 address is used for? I've had a hard time understanding that. Sure. So uh, with, with IPv6, assuming you're properly configured, you get two IP addresses. The first address is the link local address. It always starts with an FE80, FE80 address. Uh, I think we can pull, can I pull one of those up real quick? Sure. So if you take a look over here, look on my system. So right here. So that's the link local address. Every computer that has a network card in it will automatically spin up 
an IPv6 link local address. It just comes automatically. So it's FE8 uh, colon zero colon zero colon zero, and then the last 64 bits are drawn up either by using your MAC address, which is 48 bits, they add 12 more bits, uh, 60 more bits, or they draw it up, uh, they spin it up randomly. So that's your internal address. The, uh, the, the link local address is used by different IPv6 capable systems to speak within the LAN itself. So uh, if you'll notice with IPv6, you don't really have a subnet mask. I mean, you do, but it's kind of a different animal. In IPv4, we use a subnet mask to differentiate because you only have one IP address, right? So you take that one IP address, you go, oh, I need to talk on the LAN to some all the other people, or do I need to send it to my default gateway and send it out? With IPv6, you don't do that. With IPv6, if you're talking locally, use your link local address. If you want to be talking out on the internet, you got something on your browser or something like that, then you use your, uh, I, your uh, forgot the official name, so we're just going to call it the inner address. Uh, so you, you, that, that's just how that works. Does that help? Yeah, and link locals don't cross routers. They, they stay within the local area network. Oh, see, Plastman, I didn't. I wasn't going to tell anybody it was you who came up with that scenario. Yeah, well, those Wi-Fi add-ons were hers from a home. She was, yeah, just tell her, well, no, it doesn't work that way. Hey, Dr. Quinn, better late than never. Kim.net, uh, 100 nano stations are great. I got no problem with them. But I got to tell you right now, those ubiquities are probably, now uh, they're about like 200 bucks, but yeah. Just looking for more questions. Always appreciate the good words. Yes, does IPv6 still leak data? IPv6 never leaked data, what do you mean? IPv6 leaks data. I'd like to hear about that one. Okay, I'm looking for questions here, guys. Did I miss any? Scott Jernigan, help me out, brother. I'm looking right at Teams here. Link local addresses, I got that one. WPA. So you guys want to do a TKIP versus AES? We've only got three minutes left. All right, I promise this. We'll try to work on, we can do some IP, but I'm going to need emails that help develop the IP questions better. And we can talk about basic IP, uh, which I'm glad to do. That's one thing we can do for uh, this Friday. The other thing, and I'm writing it in stone because I can do this in my sleep, is talk about TKIP versus AES. What we're really going to be talking about is wireless security, 802.11 wireless security, and we'll go through web versus WPA versus WPA2. And uh, if I can find some good information that actually makes sense, I'll even drop in a little bit of WPA3, which is coming around and is going to uh, give us trouble. Oh, hey, Rob. Rob Moore, I'm going to take this here. Pass the first time. Hey, congratulations, Rob Moore. Passing the Security Plus. Well done. So, Rob, did you use any practice questions? Just curious. Yeah. But well done, sir. I really appreciate it. All right, guys, well, it looks like uh, ba -dum -ba -dum. we got some, some cosplay for me. There you go. How can I actually retain information for your Net Plus book? 
Try practicing it, enjoying it. Go buy yourself a little switch and, and get a couple of systems and plug them in together and configuring static and using NetStat and playing with all the tools. You know, most of the my cool tools that I mentioned in Network Plus are all free, you know? Go get a copy of Wireshark and play with it. Turn on your DHCP server and capture a DHCP and look at it and go, ooh, ah, you know? And uh, you know, set up a little wireless network and play with web versus WPA and all that stuff. And uh, so that's how you retain it, is you play with it. It's fun. I love this stuff. This is like my idea of a Red Hot Saturday Night is right here, man. And uh, it's, it's absolutely, uh, it's great fun. And so that's the best way you remember this stuff. Otherwise, the thing you do is practice questions. I know I harp on this a lot, guys, but practice questions are really, really important. And uh, it is, it, it, you, you just keep hitting practice questions. And then, you know, if you really get good, you really want to know one of the secrets to passing CompT exams is do a practice question and then write your own practice question, kind of based on it, but change it a little bit. If you really want to prove yourself, you know a topic, you should be able to write your own practice questions. And write 200 of them and then sell them to me, I'll buy them off you. Uh, but uh, that is the way we do it. Carl learns cameras official. I thought Mike Myers was Austin Powers. Hey baby, I put the girl in nerd, man, so I'm actually older than he is. I had the name first, so neener neener. I'm also, I was Mike Myers before Halloween movies even, so that's just how that works. Woo! Okay. I'm getting some emails. That's fantastic. That's what you, I told you guys what to do, so that, that should cover it. Guys, it is 4 o'clock. It is time for us to, once again, part company. Friday is going to be some kind of IP, but I'm really going to lean on you guys to give me some questions. I'd rather ask specific, I'd rather answer specific questions than just do a big painting thing without really a goal, okay? Uh, but we will definitely do, we're gonna do wireless security uh, on Friday for sure, and I'm going to try very, very hard to make sure that we have some kind of prizes that we'll be able to give away on Friday. We weren't able to give away last Friday, we had a couple of hiccups, uh, and, uh, but we'll, we'll do better this Friday. And uh, remember, just because you guys are nice enough to be here, we're giving away, we're giving half off all of our practice questions. So you just go to www.total7.com. My buddy Todd, uh, Scott Jernigan will type in that there. He's got the code up there already. Scott is an amazing human being, and he's good looking too. So until then, until Friday at 2 o'clock Central Daylight Time, this is your Uncle Mike saying good night. Good night.